hello again and welcome to this next video in this series that we've been doing. Um, in this episode we're going to look at John Knox and how he was used by God to take Scotland to Reformation. And we're just going to look uh, in this first part, because I'm going to do it in two parts, because there's a lot to, to cram into just a few minutes. So we'll look at John Knox and, and the Reformation in two two parts. And in this first part, um, I'm just going to look about how Knox first become, comes to the forefront of, of the Reformation in Scotland. In our last episode, we left off with the, the death of George Wishart. Now, George Wishart's death was a real major event uh, in Scotland and for the Reformation. Many of his friends were, were angry at what they saw. Um, this, this godly man being burned at the stake really infuriated a lot of people. And it had a way of also uniting uh, the Protestants in Scotland. So much so that they decided that they were going to seek revenge for, for George Wishart's death by Cardinal Beaton. So they disguised themselves as, as stonemasons and um, at the end of May 1546 there's some restoration work going on, some repair work going on at St Andrew's Castle and they disguise themselves and uh, make their way inside the castle. There's a lot of people coming in and out so they're easily able to, to gain access to the castle. Once they're inside they burst into Cardinal Beaton's bedchamber and kill him in revenge for George Wishart's death. Now, they know just how serious this thing is that they've done, and they barricade themselves inside the castle for safety. Now, the monarch in Scotland at this time is, is Mary, Queen of Scots. Her father, James V, had, had just recently died, and she was queen at a very young age. But her mother, Mary of Guise, who was French, uh, sent her over to France to, to be raised over there. So the person who was governing Scotland in her place was a man called James Hamilton, the Regent Arran. So Regent Arran, who is probably not unsympathetic to, to, to the Protestant cause, um, comes and lays siege to it because, it because he's been tasked with getting the Protestants out. But he has to be careful because inside the castle is his young son. His young son had been in the castle when the Protestants took it and the Protestants now held him hostage. So Regent Arran has to be careful how he goes about getting these Protestants outside you know, of the castle. So it's a strange situation. It becomes a mixture of, of fighting and talking. And um, at one point there's a truce where people can come and go from the castle. And uh, it's during this truce on the, the 10th of April 1547 that John Knox enters the castle. We last saw John Knox when he had said goodbye to George Wishart outside the church in Harrington, just before Wishart's education. So what, um, so, uh, so Wishart's uh, execution. So Knox knows that he's probably going to be arrested and, and possibly burned at the stake as well. So he makes his way through and joins the Protestants inside the castle of St Andrews. Others are coming in as well, other Protestant refugees, other, others who are fearing for their life because of their faith. Um, but it's not just them. There's also some political rebels and others who have made their way inside the castle for, for safety. Now when Knox goes inside here, he's shocked at just the behaviour of some of, of the, the men inside and the, the language uh, from them. That He publicly rebukes them and, and takes them to God's word and tries to get them to change their ways through preaching to them. And it becomes uh, clear pretty quickly that, that this man, John Knox, has a real gift for preaching. So, in one of the, the in the church uh, in uh, the, the centre of St Andrews, a man called John Ruff is preaching. Uh, as I said, people could come and go from from the castle at this point. So they had went to the church, and John Ruff was was preaching a sermon on the election of men to the, to to the, the post of of being a minister. At the end of that sermon, he turns to John Knox, and publicly puts him on the spot. He, he effectively says that the, the people have called, asked him to call John Knox to be their minister um, and that he shouldn't shouldn't shy away from, from what God has called him to do. Knox, he, he doesn't know what to do. He, he knows this is a real, a real serious thing that's being asked of him. And he leaves and he goes back to his own private room 
and he's in tears, he's crying, he's praying. He, he just doesn't know, you know, what to do. But eventually, though, um, God obviously speaks to him and, and he accepts the job of, of uh, minister. So, inside the castle, John Knox becomes the minister to the very first Protestant congregation in Scotland. Now, the siege is continuing. Uh, Regent Aaron is using various methods to, to try and get the, the, the Protestants out. Um, he's using bribery uh, as one example, which, which doesn't work. But behind the scenes, uh, Mary Queen of Scots' mother, Mary of Guise, has, has had enough. And she sends to, to France to, for, for help. So, uh, a, a large group of, of French warships come up and anchor off the coast of, of St Andrews and begin to bombard the castle. They also bring some cannons onto the, to, to the land and begin to shoot at the castle from there. Those inside the castle, they're known as the Castilians. They try and hold out as best as they can, but eventually it's just the cannons too much and they're forced to surrender. They're all arrested, put on board these French uh, ships, warships, as galley slaves, and for the next 19 months, chained up to the oars, they have to row between France and Scotland. John Knox's health uh, during this time never, never really recovers. Um, it, it, well, it deteriorates at this time, but for the rest of his life, it, it never, never really recovered. He would suffer poor health. For, for the rest of his, his life, and it's because of his time on board this ship. Eventually, though, um, uh, uh, probably through the influence of, of young Edward VI, uh, who was sitting on the throne of, of England, um, Protestant England, John Knox and the others are freed early in 1549. Now, Knox and the Protestants are freed, but what does Knox do? He can't stay in France. Um, can't really come back to Scotland, uh, Catholic Scotland, because the same fate as George Bishop probably awaits him here. So he goes to Protestant England, and once he goes there, he's licensed to preach, and becomes the an army chaplain, effectively, at the town of Berwick upon Tweed. Now Berwick upon Tweed at this time is a garrison town, um, a real rough, tough town with a lot of of rowdy soldiers. So when Knox goes there, it's a real difficult place to take the gospel and to labour there. But he does, and he, through Knox's preaching and just his, his, his work, uh, he really turns around the town of Berwick-upon-Tweed. Now, his fame's starting to grow at this point, and he's invited down to the bigger town of, of Newcastle. Now, when, when he's up in, in, in Berwick-upon-Tweed, he meets his, who would be his future wife, Marjorie Bowes, he falls in love and meets her. But when he leaves Berwick, it's a real different town. The town has been transformed through John Knox. But anyway, he goes to Newcastle. Again, he becomes more, more known and his fame is starting to, to spread through his, because of his gift of, of preaching. And he's invited down to, to London by young Edward VI. Young Edward VI had taken over from his father, Henry VIII, and uh, he was actually more of a, a, a more, more Protestant uh, king than, than, his, than his father, um, more interested in, in the things of God. So Knox goes down to London. At one point he's offered the position of Bishop of Rochester, but he refuses. He doesn't accept the, the position of Bishop. Sadly, uh, young Edward wasn't on the throne long in England, and in July 1553, young Edward dies. The person who takes over the throne of England we would, would later become known as Bloody Mary. Her name was Mary Tudor. Bloody Mary takes over the throne of England and begins the work of taking England back to, to Roman Catholicism. Many people are, are, are put to death, many Protestants are put to death during her reign. And the same thing would have happened to John Knox had his friends not got together and urged him to leave and to go uh, away from England. He doesn't want to. He wants to stay. But his friends are, are really insistent that he goes for his own safety. So reluctantly, he leaves and goes over to, to the, 
uh, to the continent. Um, eventually, after a little while over there, he makes his way to Geneva, where he goes. Uh, and Geneva's a place where, where many Protestant refugees are going. He goes there, he meets John Calvin, and his time there is a real time of, of, of uh, maturity for, for John Knox. And God is preparing him for what lies ahead of him in Scotland. So his time there, um, he's there for, for till 1556, when he's first asked to come back to Scotland and see what's happening. And that's where we're going to pick up uh, in the next time, in the next video, Knox's return to Scotland in 1556. Because during his time um, in England, things have been moving ahead in Scotland. Um, during his time in England and, and over at Geneva, Protestantism is growing through the help of, of, of Protestant pamphlets and the printing press um, and God just working in Scotland. Reformation is really starting to happen and, and things are moving ahead and Protestantism is growing. So we'll continue with Knox's return to Scotland in 1556 in our next video. So thanks uh, again for, for watching um, and we'll bring the, the second part of John Knox and the Reformation in Scotland, that part of the Reformation in Scotland in our next video. So look out for that. Thank you.